Okay, well, and aloha. Welcome to another edition of Military in Hawaii. I'm the host, Calvin, uh, Calvin Griffin. And uh, for those of you who haven't seen the program in the past, here in the program we talk about military and veterans issues anyhow. Uh, one other thing I wanted to reiterate is that here in the program we're going to be talking about a lot of different issues and we want to make sure that the information is informative and correct. Uh, some of the things that we'll be talking about today may make a few people uncomfortable, but the thing is we need to discuss certain things in an open and honest um, uh, environment anyhow. Uh, the other thing is I have the rule I have here, if uh, you hear me or my guests anything that you think is an error, please give us a call here and uh, feel free to express yourself. Like I said, just come with the facts and we'll deal with that. Uh, today my guest is going to be Mr. Uh, Mark McCabe, who's with the Vietnam Veterans of America. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, an issue that really doesn't get that much attention, We do, well, not in the mainstream press. And this is about the effects, uh, birth defects, in the military and veterans community. And um, again, this is one of the things that um, I think there needs to be more discussion on because it um, can affect several generations. So right now at this moment, I'd like to introduce Mr. Mark McCabe to the program. Uh, Mark, are you there? I am here. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, could you tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and your connection with the, um, uh, as far as Vietnam? <clears throat> yes, um, I'm the Bureau Chief for Vietnam Veterans of America, and our organization is the only congressionally chartered uh, veteran service organization to represent veterans and their families and their children okay. in front of the Department of Veterans Affairs and to get them duly compensated. <clears throat> okay. Um, my background is, uh, I, I'm a, I am a Vietnam combat veteran. Mm -hmm. um, I, came, I grew up in a military family, and I did my tours in Vietnam, and then I came back. Okay, good. Uh, you, currently, you're living in uh, Florida? I'm living in southwest Florida. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Good. Um, this issue, like again, that we're discussing is, um, of course, the health issues. There's a lot of things that go on within the, in the community that uh, are not, you know, publicly discussed, you know. And one of the things as far as this issue about birth defects, I know that you're very close to that issue. Could you uh, inform our viewers, uh, you know, your, um, what the, is the current situation is right now is as far as addressing this and some of the um, problems that arose, that arose, has arisen, you know, uh, within the community? Certainly. Um, being a veterans of America, what we do is we have um, town hall meetings where we travel around the United States and the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. To bring to attention to the, the public, the, the veteran community, the active duty military community about the effects of the toxic substance in time of war. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, it was uh, referred to as exposure to Agent Orange for the people in Vietnam. But because of the mass production of depleted uranium in Iraq during the OEF OIF conflict, the burn pits, they've changed it to reflect the toxic effects on children and the veteran from the uh, duration of war. Yeah. And some of those issues are, are very important to the, the family members because not only the family members get these horrendous cancers and uh, heart conditions and uh, skin conditions, right. they're also the children. The children are born with spina bifida, which is a crippling disease. And the VA currently, you know, they um, compensate um, the children on different levels based on uh, the, the, the disability effects that they have. So they have a level one, a level two, and a level three. And level three is normally when a child is in a wheelchair for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. and so we have children that are, we call them children, but they're, they're 40 and 48 years of age, and some right. of them are younger in, the, in their 30s. But we do have a lot of children that are confined to a wheelchair for the rest of their life, and yeah. that's from the spina bifida. But we, we have, there's 17 other presumptive illnesses for people that served in Vietnam, mm -hmm. uh, they were exposed to the um, contaminated dioxin, which uh, was from the Agent Orange herbicide. It was a herbicide. They called it Agent Orange because it had um, an orange band around the barrels that they brought over to Vietnam to spray and kill the defoliant. It was a defoliant to um, kick back the weeds and the, the undercover so that the Vietnamese could sneak up on the bases. Right, yeah. um, but now we have the contaminated water issue that's affected uh, thousands of children mm -hmm. from the Camp Lejeune contaminated water. And they are also coming down with the same illnesses, cancers, um, uh, spinal defects, 
um, neurological defects. So there's a lot of, there's a, altogether there's like 35 different right. uh, presumptive illnesses mm -hmm. for both of those uh, sets of families. Okay. With these uh, effects, um, this is not only confined to the first generation, but also possibly the second generation that um, come up with genetic defects? Yeah, we, we have we have actually seen it in uh, in the United States uh, three generations. Three. Um, we three generations. But wow. the, the thing is, the government, our government, the United States, uh, the United States government, only recognizes it into the first generational issue. Uh -huh. Just recently, um, in the last session of the bipartisan House that ended in December of uh, 2016, they passed the new uh, Children's Act. And then that act, it's, it's dictating the VA to start to do studies to see if it is a generational issue and how does it pass down to the second and third generation. Mm -hmm. As we've seen it in Vietnam where it's, uh, it's been passed down to the fourth generation. But again, in Vietnam, because we dumped 11 million gallons of this contaminated herbicide into their water supply, into their food chain, it, it's still affecting their children today. They're being born 50 years later they're being born with these horrendous uh, illnesses and, and birth defects. All right, yeah. Um, well, you know, with this, something of this magnitude, um, it doesn't seem to be that, you know, the, a lot of the information doesn't seem to be showing up in the mainstream press. I know from time to time, if something does happen, it comes and it fades. Is there any more of awareness that's going on, or we, uh, is there more of a cry for, you know, the um, government to, you know, accept responsibility in certain areas for these situations? Well, I think what happens is that um, the Department of Veterans Affairs is basically in charge of um, taking care of the veterans that when they transition from active duty to veteran status, mm -hmm. you know, they, they don't do a lot of outreach. So they're, they're not, just like in the current uh, warriors we have from the OEF, OIF conflict, Afghanistan, uh, Djibouti, Somalia, Syria, and um, Iraq, mm -hmm. you know, they're not being told of what these illnesses are and they're not being so they're not doing outreach programs. So it, it leaves it up to these individual service organizations to make the public aware of it. So that's why the Vietnam veterans, when we were officially chartered by Congress, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of our motto was never again shall one generation of veterans leave another generation behind. Right. So we started doing outreach programs in town hall meetings at our own expense, mm -hmm. traveling around the United States and the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, or basically wherever someone an interested party invites us to do these presentations. Mm -hmm. We go in there with a panel of expert people that um, have the knowledge of either the exact illness, the, the disease, the process of how to get compensated, the process of how to take care of the children, mm -hmm. and be, you know, be, have the, the bills paid for. Mm -hmm. So we, we do that on a regular basis. Every month we're, we're traveling. The last two months I've been in um, uh, Texas uh, and Florida, we did a seven-day presentation through seven different counties. So it, we, we make people aware of it, and we not just make them aware of it and then leave. We give them the, the information so they can process the, the aspect of how to do the claim, how to file a claim with the government, mm -hmm. and if they get denied, we, we, will, we will represent them pro bono up to the Court of Appeals at the Board of Veterans' Appeals. So. Right. They, they have competent, all of our people are, are uh, trained in the legal aspects and we have four attorneys at the board that represents the children and the, and the veteran, uh, and like I said, pro bono, there's no charge to right. the, the okay. people. Uh, with the uh, number of um, female personnel in the military now, um, what it, you mentioned there's, um, what, 32 different um, uh, uh, the problems that have been identified so far or more? Well, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a, well, you know, like in cancers, there's so many different cancers under the, the um, one I, one contention of cancer, because, you know, skin cancers, there's myelomas, multiple myelomas, there's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, there's adult leukemia. Mm -hmm. But there's all these cancers that are linked to the, um, the carcinogenic from the uh, contaminated dioxin that mm -hmm. was in these herbicides. Yeah. So well, they have a multiple birth defects, they have a multiple miscarriages stillborn babies, mm -hmm. so, you know, and it's all been tied to this. So we're, we're trying to get that awareness out to everybody so that they know, because then the, the veteran is still sorry because, or feels bad that they passed it on to their children, mm -hmm. so they have this, this feeling that, well, you know, it was my fault. Well, they, weren't, they didn't ask to be sprayed by these herbicides, and they weren't asked to be 
exposed to the depleted uranium in right. Iraq. So, you know, it's, that's why we have to do these awareness and make people aware of what's going on. Yeah, because when some of these things, when it seems like it develops, it's like the onus is put on the service member like, say, to prove, you know, where they have to go into the extensive research and everything else. Um, but um, uh, I don't like to say it just boggles the mind sometimes how, um, you know, um, the bureaucracy bra drags their feet when as far as compensation, you know, for a legitimate uh, problem that arose from your, you know, your, your service to your country. But not, yeah, not only just the concept of the exposure to toxic substance, but mm -hmm. just in general, when a when a veteran military person transitions to the civilian world, mm -hmm. it, it'll take him sometimes maybe a year or two years before he gets his uh, case uh, completed and is compensated. Yeah. And sometimes because they don't have the right documentation, uh, maybe because when people came up, for instance, when people came home from Vietnam, especially the Army guys, mm -hmm. they, they transitioned to Oakland Army uh, Center. And they just they came in there, they were there for one day, and they got processed out. So they didn't put on their paperwork that they had this medal uh, for being in Vietnam. So they didn't have the evidence to prove that they had boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. And in the early part of the years, it, it, you had to prove exactly which um, corps that you had served in in Vietnam, because we had four, corps, four different geographical areas that we call I Corps, II Corps, III Corps, something like that. Right. But if you didn't have that verification, they said you weren't exposed to enough of the contaminant to be, have this disability. Mm -hmm. Then we, the Vietnam Veterans of America, along with several other organizations, sued the Department of Veterans Affairs and basically the United States of America, saying that that's not right. They should be granted presumptive illnesses if they had boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. So then they finally said, okay, yeah, that's true. So they changed that rule in the 80s, saying that as long as you have boots on the ground, that's all we care about. If you can prove you had boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. So... That's always been a stumbling block, and then, of course, with, with, the, with these children's illnesses, the claims are only processed in one center. We have 56 regional offices within the Department of Veterans Affairs, right. and the only regional office that does this processing is in Denver, Colorado, mm -hmm. and they're so secretive of how many claims have come in, how many claims have gone out, and it, it's hard to get a, a, a true feeling of exactly what has gone on with these claims, you know, we're, we're, were they, I mean, we, we've made the assumption that they kept them always, but they haven't. And yeah. we've made the assumption that they were going to store for data rights of the second generation children. We knew they were not going to pay them, but we wanted to show the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Institute of Medicine mm -hmm. that, hey, all these second generations are having the same issues that the first generation children had, and we right. know that's a, a contaminated dioxin that resides in a fatty tissue, and it can transmit to the seminal process when you have a um, reproduction cycle. So yeah. it, it, it's out there, it's known, it's just that we have to fight it all the time to get the grant for the children and for yeah. the veteran themselves. Right. Uh, what in the case, because I know sometimes where, you know, a, a child may be put up for adoption, you know, um, by another, in, you know, of course adopted by another family, uh, if there's someone out there that um, their biological parent um, did serve and it was passed on, is there any options for them as far as, um, let's say, some resource where they can go back and you know, try to make a, get a claim or compensation for their uh, disabilities? And we actually have a case like that right now before the Board of Veterans Appeals. Mm -hmm. that, um, the child was um, adopted, so her, bio her biological dad is not the dad that she's living with, she's living with a new set of parents. Mm -hmm. Neither one of them served in a service, so um, they had to get the service members' records because the first thing we do, or the first thing I should say, the VA does, first thing the VA does to uh, verify all this stuff is, do you have a DD-214, did you serve in Vietnam? Then we need the birth certificate and the marriage certificate to prove that the child was an offspring of the veteran that actually served in Vietnam. So. Right that's one of the cases we have before the court right now. So yeah. that's that's a very good point because we, we see that a lot. And because, you know, be, be honest with you, and, um, the Vietnam veteran who came home, a, a majority of them, they had more than one marriage because yeah. the, the post-traumatic stress issue kicked in and, you know, they, they weren't, we weren't welcome when we came home, okay? we Not like the current veterans that come home from Iraq and Afghanistan right. because, you know, the past president said they were the next generation of the greatest heroes, and mm -hmm. Vietnam veteran wasn't looked like that. So they had multiple marriages, and so 
it, it's we, we know we find some children that have these illnesses mm -hmm. they never got taken care of because the new set of parents didn't know that the dad served in Vietnam so what we're asking yeah. when we do these town hall meetings we we ask the local medical facilities you know when when you're doing an intake of a of a veteran if you know he's a veteran ask him where he served mm -hmm. if you served in Vietnam there's a list of questions we'd like for you to ask them yeah. we have you ever been ill have you ever had one of these 17 presumptive illnesses. Did you have children? Did, were your children born with any type of a disability? Mm. And because there's two things that come into play for the children, and a lot of people don't realize this, yeah. that if your child was born and before they would come the age of 18, if they were totally disabled, the VA will pay the parents compensation to take care of that child the rest of his or her life. Yeah. But they don't go out and tell you that, but that's mm. the law. That's the 38 CFR, which is the code of federal regulation. So those are other issues that we find out when we go do these town hall meetings that, well, I didn't know that I could have my child taken care of. You know, I had to put them in a state nursing home. Mm -hmm. and so you know, these, are, these are things that we really need to get out there and be aware of for the, the veterans and their, their family members. Yeah, it, it seems a little, a little bit frustrating because I see when a problem comes up, <coughs> you have our legislators who um, they pass these laws and they put something out there, but then they're slow to implement them as far as, you know, what's going to have a, uh, you know, a positive effect, you know, short term anyhow, you know. But um, are there more, um, what about out in Washington? I mean, is there a, a move afoot to go ahead and try to correct some of these things, the speed of the process? Because you mentioned that um, the only, the center in, in uh, Denver is the only one that's processing right. the papers now. Yeah, I mean, it just seems with all the resources that our government has that they could be, you know, at least one on each coast or whatever, you know. But, um, you know, it, it just boggles the mind, like say, is um, the lack of response in a lot of the areas, you know. I think that's been one of the biggest issues we've seen in the past 10 years mm -hmm. is the uh, lack of accountability and um, expediting claims for uh, veterans and their family members who have terminal illnesses. Yeah. Okay. They just sit out there and, and it could be two or three years and it's not lack of uh, people. They have the people. They just right. they just don't have, there's not accountability within the VA system yeah. to hold someone accountable for their jobs. Well, we need to do that. I tell you, Mark, we're going to take a uh, short break and then we'll come back. We'll continue our conversation here on Think Like Hawaii, Military in Hawaii. Hello, I'm Dean Nelson, host of Planet of the Courageous. From a Tibetan point of view, we chose to be on this planet because we enrolled in a sort of graduate school for courage. Just that we may have chosen this adventure is a leap of logic. The question is, how do we spend and make sense of this precious human life? We are, as a species, extraordinarily successful, dominating the planet and now with planetary sized problems that our existence itself has created. It takes courage to face not only the uncertainty of life, but also the challenge of sustaining this gift of life for future generations. Join us every Monday at 3 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Okay, you're back with the military in Hawaii, and uh, again, I'm your host, Calvin. And uh, right now, my guest uh, on phone, by phone, is Mr. Mark McCabe, who's with the Vietnam Veterans of America. And our subject matter today is the um, birth defects or different health issues within the military community. Uh, Mark, before we took the break, you mentioned that um, the VA, uh, there's been a lot of issues, of course, um, you know, um, that seem to constantly be developing, you know, and is there any way or, I mean, we hear that there's changes being made, but do you think that there's anything, I mean, that this is, it could be speeded up a little bit more because we do have veterans who are literally dying, you know, waiting for benefits, and again, not to mention, like say, this subject matter with the uh, the, their spouse, I mean, their, their offspring, anyhow. But uh, do you see anything that is really um, gelling that's going to correct the system? I think, you know, uh, Dr. Shulkin, who's been named the new secretary of the VA, mm -hmm. he's relatively new in that position, less than 100 days. Mm -hmm. And I've already seen, I mean, I work at a regional office in St. Petersburg, which is the largest regional, one of the largest regional offices in all of all 56. Mm -hmm. And we have like 1,400 employees at our building. And but Dr. Shulkin has already made, I, I think, uh, some good inroads. He's made some promises, and we're seeing some positive uh, forces. We, we just recently, at our regional office, mm -hmm. got a new uh, director who I think is um, outstanding in terms of 
her um, professionalism and her empathy towards the veteran, mm -hmm. unlike the previous administration we had. So yeah. well, I, I, I see it's coming around. It's just, it, it's not going to go overnight. And I think that's the sad part because we need to do the, it needs to be done quickly in an expeditious way because too many veterans are dying before their benefits are paid out. Yeah. And if they die before they're paid out, the, you know, the VA doesn't always tell the, the widow that, oh, by the way, if you had a claim pending for either your husband or your child, mm -hmm. you can do a substitution of claimant. Yeah. So you can, you can actually be the stand-in, and then you would receive the accrued benefits as well as DIC, which is like a widow's dependent indemnity compensation. So right. we'll compensate you for the rest of your life to take care of you because, mm -hmm. after all, that's what Abraham Lincoln said, to take care of the, 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 the warrior, the orphans, the children, and the wives. Yeah, because it seems like when they, uh, when uh, things are not implemented or there's a lag in um, the compensation, and a lot of people, you know, it's just this is something that people earn, you know, not that they're um, looking for a freebie or anything like that, you know. Uh, but um, it just seems that, um, you know, because one thing, uh, we talked about this in the past, and when the system, the federal system doesn't take care of the veterans, then in a roundabout way that falls on the local communities as far as putting the strain on the different services that's available to the rest of the civilian population. Um, but um, I don't know. The, what response to, um, with the different organizations, I know with the organization you're with, but uh, the other major, major organizations, are they really putting the full court press on our uh, legislators to bring some changes about? They are. We, we have what's called a big six meeting, and that big six meeting is the big, the top six uh, mm -hmm. veteran service organizations Morph, which is members of the Purple Heart, MOA, the members of the Officers Association of America, mm -hmm. American Legion, the Disabled Veterans, um, Paralyzed Veterans of America. So it, we, we do meet once a month and try to be collectively put the pressure onto the VA to do the right thing for the veteran. Because as, as you said, and I think what happens is because we have so many civilians working with inside the Department of Veterans Affairs, mm -hmm. they don't understand the, the, the acronyms, let alone what these members have gone through to, to give them their freedom. So right, yeah. they think it's a handout. We know it's an earned benefit. We earn this benefit, mm -hmm. but it's taken sometimes years, uh, if not, for instance, in the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, I have a case that's been pending since 1991 wow. because it's bounced back and forth from the board to uh, local jurisdiction, back to the board. So the veteran is sitting out there, you know, with a disabled child because she was a female member in the Army. She got a um, rubella shot. The child was born premature, and he is now 38 years old, but he is totally handicapped, totally incapacitated. Mm -hmm. So she had to quit her job to take care of her son. Mm -hmm. And like you said, because she didn't get her compensation, the local community has to pick up that slack there. And, and, that, and it's not that they shouldn't. They should, but mm -hmm. we should be able to take care of that child so that the child gets his due uh, benefits to be taken care of, yeah. and because that's one extra slot that someone else could use, because you know you only have so many beds sometimes in these skilled nursing facilities, mm -hmm. and if you use them all up, with, and so it just it needs to be taken care of and done on a more uh, a quicker basis. Yeah. Okay. The other thing I want to bring up, uh, not only with Agent Orange, but I know that there has um, been issues in the past as far as with the anthrax shots and different inoculations that uh, the troops have been receiving. And there's been some uh, areas that, or some individuals or groups out there that claim there may be a correlation. Um, I don't want to go too far up, you know, out in the left field, but uh, is that another issue that's being dealt with or talked about? Uh, it, it's talked about in this sense. Uh -huh. the, the way the law is written, and if, if let's say you got the anthrax shot, you did come down seriously, or you came down with, you know, some type of deliberating um, illness that you can't work, mm -hmm. and if you can get a medical opinion, mm -hmm. and the medical opinion says it is more than likely caused by this shot, and the doctor will put that in the medical opinion, then that person has a, a probably a 90 plus percent chance of getting a benefit. Uh -huh. But if you don't have a link to the nexus, you know, then you're going to get denied. Yeah. But there are, there are cases, I mean, that's why a lot of people during the the height of the war when they were all being forced to take the anthrax, mm -hmm. people uh, declined it because of the earlier days when they had those shots, people became uh, seriously ill. Some of them got into muscle uh, spasms and muscle um, 
paralysis and mm -hmm. other illnesses of the musculoskeletal system. Right. Hmm. Okay. But they, uh, with the time we have left, anyhow, I want to bring up what are some of the organizations out there or contact points that people could, um, you know, contact to get more information? Because uh, this, like I say, not only affects the people, I mean, those in the military, but, um, you know, on the civilian side. I mean, because we have to, you know, encourage the um, civilian side to, uh, you know, make sure that uh, our representatives uh, keep their promises to our troops, you know, and because these are the people out, out there that's, you know, fighting on our behalf. So. Well, there's, you know, for the children, there's always, you know, the birth defects registry. Okay, and yeah. um, if you can Google that birth defects registry. The Shriners is a good um, source of information because the Shriners have always taken care of children. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, uh, the hospital in Tennessee is a good one. Okay. It, within the government side, I mean, uh, Vietnam Veterans of America is, is one who led the initiative to get these presumptive illnesses for them, and they are also the ones who led the, the big push and initiative to get the OEF, OAF veteran the, the benefits that they deserve because we know what happened to our veterans when they came home. Yeah. We didn't want to see that happen to the modern-day warriors, so yeah. that's a good source. Yeah. American Legion is a good source for information. Mm -hmm. uh, the other ones really deal with their site-specific organizations like MORF, you know, you have to be a member of a perp you have to have a Purple Heart to be a member of MORF, right. MOA, you have to be an officer, and mm -hmm. so there's, there's other organizations out there and there's a lot of good information, there's, and each state has like a Leukemia Society or a Spina okay. Bifida Society, but the, the main one, the ones that keeps all the tracking, the data to discussed with IOM, the Institute of Medicine, is the birth defects registry. Uh -huh. And that, that's an excellent resource. Yeah. And Vietnam Veterans of America is an excellent resource too. I, I really have to say that because they've led the push ever since we came home. So, and we, we are the ones who helped lead the push to get the Camp Lejeune contaminated water right. issue because there was, two, there was two side effects to that. One was compensating the veteran for his benefits, but then we've got the law passed last two years ago, mm -hmm. which is the Camp Lejeune Compassion Act, where the VA is supposed to take care of the family members who come down with this list of 17 presumptive illnesses yeah. from the contaminated waters at Camp Lejeune, right. but they're supposed to pay for their health care. Yeah. But the VA doesn't go out and tell you all that. So, you, yeah. you know, that's why we try to do these town halls and do mm -hmm. radio talk shows and and get on the news as much as we can about it. Okay. Mark, we're getting down to the wire, uh, but anyhow, um, you know, what we'd like to do is follow up on this because there's a lot of very, very good information that you're putting out there. And uh, again, here in Hawaii, I don't, there's not that many sources that I've seen that's been addressing the issue. But um, yeah, it affects all of us. Uh, I appreciate, uh, you know, the, what you do in your organization. And um, I think I say keep up with good work and we'll, we'll keep in touch. The one, th one other thing I want to touch on real quick, and I think we'll do a follow up program on this if you're willing. Uh, DD 214s is one issue that I want to talk about real brief is the fact that uh, when you 214 there's a code and um, there's been some discussion about what may be uh, some of the coding, how it could affect you. And like I say, in a future program we'll be talking about that. Mark, do you have anything final you want to say before we go? Uh, you mean on a spin code or just in oh. general? Oh, no, I mean, or in general. Like I, say, yeah. we got, I think we got about 30 yeah. seconds or so. Okay. I think the spin codes are really important because it can stop a veteran from getting a good job if he has a bad spin code on there, just like yeah. the discharge, type of discharge he has. Right. Okay, because I know this is more than 100. What, well, like I said, we'll talk about that in the future, but I do encourage people, okay. if you're out there, check out the spin codes in there. Okay. All right. Mark, could you give out your number one more time before we go? Do we have a contact? My telephone number? Yeah. Oh, the contact number would be uh, 727 area code 319. Five nine two one. That rings in my office. Great. Okay. And uh, the the national office is one three zero one five eight five four thousand. That's in Washington D.C. Okay. Uh, Mark, thanks a lot. Like I said, we'll be in touch. And uh, again, thank you for taking the time to join us here on um, Military in Hawaii. And I want to thank you. Very thank much. you very much. Okay. And thank you for tuning in. And uh, we'll see you in the next couple of weeks.